I hope you guys are fired up to uh, get into the scriptures this morning. You know, uh, it, it's been a great service thus far. Uh, just having all everyone. The house is full today, man. And, and you guys are just singing so beautifully this morning. Every time I hear God's people sing to him, I know there's some grateful disciples in the house. Amen. You know, but I, I'm very excited to preach the word as usual. But I'm extra excited to preach the word because I got my family in the house, amen. I got my brother, I got my aunt right here. I got my sister, and mom, my nephews. I got all of my family out here supporting today. I'm so grateful for you guys being here. Thank you for your love. Miss you guys a lot. Let's get into the Holy Scriptures this morning. How many know the word of God is holy? You know, the word of God is holy. If you don't know what holy means, it means set apart. And the word of God is set apart from any book on this planet. Amen. You know, I hope this morning you came to give Jesus your best. You know, I know some of us came to look our best. But it's not about looking your best. It's about giving God your best this morning. I hope you're ready to give God your best. Amen. But most importantly, I hope that you're ready to give the best of your heart to Jesus. Turn with me, if you will, in your Holy Scriptures to Acts chapter 22. Acts 22. We're just going to get right into the Bible this morning. We need some scriptures in our life. Amen. You know what? And we're going to look at Acts 22, and we're going to look at Paul narrating his conversion. And I believe there, there are some important things that we're going to learn this morning about Paul's conversion. Come on, brother. In verse 6, Paul says, About noon, as I came near Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord, I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting, he replied. My companions saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. I hope you understand the voice of Jesus this morning. On, what shall I do, Lord, I asked. Get up, the Lord said, and go into Damascus. There you will be told all that you have been assigned to do. My companions led me by the hand into Damascus because the brilliance of the light had blinded me. You know, I read this passage because Paul right here talks about how he came to Jesus. But not only does Paul talk about how he came to Jesus, but he talks about what he was assigned to do. Jesus told him, hey, go to Damascus and there you will find your assignment. You see, any time that you come to Jesus, Jesus has some assignments for you to do. But you know, in Acts chapter 9, another narrative of Paul's conversion, we begin to understand what were those assignments. In Acts chapter 9, verse 15, it says, But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings, and to the people of Israel. You see, Paul got his vision from the Lord right here. His vision, his assignment was to proclaim Jesus' name to the Gentiles. His assignment was to proclaim the name of Jesus to kings and to God's people of Israel. But, but now let's look at and see how did Paul, take this assignment. Turn with me to Acts chapter 20. Because I believe Jesus can give you vision, great vision. But it takes a special person to accept that vision. In Acts chapter 20, one of my favorite scriptures, in verse 22, we'll pick it up there. It says, and now compelled by the Spirit... I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, 
I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. If only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. The task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. You know, I love scriptures like this because sometimes they don't need preaching. The scripture just preached itself that Paul's heart was to complete the task. You know, but I, I love Paul because as he was assigned this great vision, Paul already knew that this vision was going to cost him some pain. And you see, sometimes when God gives you a vision in your heart, some of us don't want to take it because you know that it entails hardship, that it entails suffering. But we see that Paul understood that nothing was going to stop him from completing the task that Jesus gave him. You know, but I believe as a church this morning, God has assigned us a great vision. But for this vision to come to pass, we must all own that vision. And that's what Paul did. He owned that vision. So we're going to talk about owning the vision that God has given us this morning. Amen. The title of my lesson is Own the Vision. Turn with me to Proverbs chapter 29. You know, in order to own your vision, you must first have a dynamic vision. Point number one. A dynamic vision. Proverbs 29, a very familiar scripture that we always read. And it starts in verse 18. It says, where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. But blessed is he who keeps the law. You know, the KJV says, where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. And, and, and I, I, when I look at this, I'm like, man, God shows us that if you do not have great vision in your life, you will perish spiritually. But to have a dynamic vision means that it's a force that stimulates change. It, it, it helps you to see things that you cannot see physically now, but that you will see later on. You know, the vision from the Lord should create a change in your life as you answer the call. But I learned something here about where in verse 18 it says the people perish and the NASB, it uses the phrase unrestraint, which in the Hebrew means to let go, to let loose, or even to ignore. See, when you ignore the visions of God, you become aimless in your walk with God. Without vision, your life becomes Nothing to shoot towards or even for. And I believe that there's some of us in this, this room this morning who, who are lacking vision for our, our lives. There's some of us in these pews that come to church every day and don't think about the vision that God has given you to fulfill. You know, God's word provides vision. You know, you know what I like about God's word is that if you don't have vision for your life, God said, it's okay, open up the Bible, and you're going to get a ton of vision for what I want you to do. You know, there's an awesome quote by P.K. Bernard who said, a man without vision is a man without a future. A man without a future will always return to his past. You see... You know why we get lukewarm in the church? You know why we fall away from God? It's because you have no vision. And, and when you have no vision, when you are not trying to do something great for God, you will die spiritually. You will return to your past. You will return to your past sins. You will return to the old you that died in the waters of baptism. But you know why we don't like to have vision for our lives or even shoot for anything big? It's because there's fear. You know, fear is the number one thing that will stop you from completing the visions that God has for you. You know, there's been times in my life where I've, I've, I've tried to dream small so that I know for sure I'm going to hit this dream. But I'm afraid sometimes to dream big 
Because I'm afraid if I put it out there and it doesn't happen, that I'm going to lose faith. But when you look at the Bible, you see that God is a visionary. When you look at the Bible, you see that, man, God is bigger than any vision for your life. And if he is big, your visions must be big. You know, vision calls you to love the work you do. You know, what I've, what I've learned about having great vision for God is that it excites you. It creates a deep passion. But it also inspires you to work towards that vision. You know, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Yep. And if you don't plan anything, if you don't set up no goals, if you don't put anything before God's throne, you'll begin to lose all the vision that God has for you. You know, I want to read you guys a little snippet of, uh, of, a, of a passage that I found in an article about Walt Disney. Now, Walt Disney, I don't know about you, but I grew up in the 90s. I grew up watching Disney movies. Even the campus ministry this, uh, this Friday, we, we got to go see The Lion King. And, you know, Disney, man, this guy was a visionary. But I, I want to read you this. It says, Mr. Walt Disney sat in an open field many years ago, just shortly after opening Disney World. And at the time, the park only had a few rides. And yet he sat and looked out into the field for a long time and seemed very preoccupied. A worker was cleaning and, and came by to ask Miss Disney, what was he doing? He told the worker that he was looking at this mountain. Many years later, at the opening of Space Mountain, a young man introduced Miss Disney to the platform. He said that it, that it was great to have her there, but it was a tragedy that Mr. Disney had died without seeing his mountain become a reality. Miss Disney took the mic and corrected the young man. She told the crowd that they were just seeing the mountain, but her husband had seen it many years before. You see, that, 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 that's a visionary. A visionary is someone who, who sees something that is so great, so big, so incredibly over your head, that you, with faith, know that it will come true if you continue to push forward towards that vision. You know, the power of vision is it's incredible. It's, it's magnificent. It's expiring. But vision is seeing beyond what you see in front of you. You know, what visions do you have for God this morning? What, what great thing do you personally want to do for God? What are you holding back in your heart that he's actually put on your heart to do for him? You know, I love God because all throughout the scriptures, like I said, he gives us things to look forward to. You know, he, he gives us the vision of heaven. And I don't know how much you think about heaven. I think about heaven all the time. And, and God put that in the scriptures to give you something to work towards, to give you something to shoot for. You know, God gives us the vision of evangelizing the world in this generation through the scriptures. But I think some of us are, are on, the jo on the joy ride of some of these promises and some of these visions. That we, we, we are part of a congregation that believes that in this generation we can actually go and evangelize the world. But for some of us, we're like, you know, that's, that's the church's vision. That's not necessarily my vision. It's the church's vision. Well, the Bible says it needs to be your vision. Because anyone who has become a disciple has been assigned to the evangelization of this world. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 17. In Genesis chapter 17, we're going to look at Father Abraham. You know, I've been reading the book of Genesis from my quiet times. And it's been so faith building to see how faithful God is. And in Genesis chapter 17, we'll pick it up in verse 1. It says, when Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will walk. I will confirm my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Abraham fell face down 
And God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abraham. Abram, you will now be called Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you. And kings will come for you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan, where you are now an alien, I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. You know, this is a covenant that God makes with Abraham. But before this, it's interesting because in chapter 15, verses 1 through 2, as God promises all these blessings to Abraham, all these descendants that will come from him. Abraham's like, God, how can you give me all these things? And yet I do not have an heir. I don't have a son. You have yet to give me that. And that is all Abraham wanted was a son. But what I learned from this is that, man, when you desire, when, when your vision is for something, God just expands that vision. You see, as people, we think too small. We think so tiny. Abraham was like, man, I just want to have a, just, just one son that when I die, he can have my wealth. And, and I'm good to go. Like, I'm okay. Like, God's been taking care of me, and that's it. But God says, no, if you obey me, if you stick to this covenant, not only will I give you a son, but you will be a father of all nations. You know, God expects you to believe in bigger things than what you see. You know, this is something that I feel like I'm learning in my Christianity, is to dream big. Like, I've always had, like, big dreams, like, in the world. But, you know, when you're coming from the world and, and you're coming to the kingdom, you know, your motives change. Your hearts change. And I'm like, man, okay, now my, my big vision and, and, and the things that God's calling me to do have to be for him now. And they have to exceed my expectations. And that's something that John Causey's actually been teaching me, to dream bigger. Because I serve a big God. And he's called me higher in, this, in, this, in my walk with God. And, and I've been thinking, I was like, man, when I think of Metro Heights, I just have great vision. I see this, this whole, you know, church being packed with full, sold-out disciples. I see the campus ministry just filling up this whole area of just 50 campus students. I see downtown just, just baptizing just prominent men and women and having a whole sector just in downtown. You know, I can't wait to up the worship in the congregation. You know, I'm so grateful Michael's doing and heading the, the worship service because he's going to take it to new heights. I, you know, there's so many songs that we can sing to glorify God. You know, and I want to worship God. I want to change the worship. I want Metro Heights to have weekly editions. I want every sector of Metro Heights to bring someone to God every month. But I want to see some more dating couples. I want to see some people date in God's kingdom. I want to see some people get married in God's kingdom. Can y'all get spiritual so y'all can just date? Can y'all can y'all just just get spiritual so that y'all can date and get married and increase God's kingdom? You know, God has, has helped me to envision more than I can ask or imagine. And I hope that this morning you're gonna dream big for the Lord. Turn with me to Luke chapter four. You know, we're gonna look at one of the greatest examples of a visionary who understood what he was called to do. In Luke chapter 4, verse 16, it says, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. And he stood up to read, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. 
He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And I don't know about you, but this scripture fires me up. Because Jesus, he knew the vision that God had for him, and he boldly gets up. He says, you know what? The scriptures talked about me. I just want you to know that the scriptures talked about me. Hand me that scroll. He grabs the scroll, and I could just, and you know, the book of Isaiah is long. So he, he unrolls the scroll, and I just imagine it just falling and just rolling through the audience. And he reads it. And he says, the spirit of the Lord is on me. Like, how bold is that? He believed the vision. He says, I have come to preach good news to the poor. I have come to proclaim freedom for the prisoners. I have come to recover the sight of the blind. And what I love about this is that this, this verse wasn't just for Jesus. It was for you. It was for me. That anyone who becomes the disciple of Jesus is called to proclaim good news to those who are enslaved. You see, if you are not a disciple of Jesus, you are enslaved by sin. If you are enslaved to sin, that means that you are blind. That you cannot see the things that God wants you to see. That you can't see the vision that God has for your life. But Jesus made it very clear that he would accomplish this task. But you know, we live in a, a global epidemic of spiritual blindness. And it's up to us to instill vision into those who have no vision. You know, I want to challenge us this morning to have a vision for God and have a great vision to be used by God in a powerful way. But maybe you, don't, maybe you feel like, man, I don't, I, don't, I don't know what I want to do in my relationship with God. Pray about it. I guarantee if you start begging God and praying, God, put a vision within my heart and in my soul so that I can worship you and glorify you through that. Because we have to remember, family, that if you aim at nothing, you will hit nothing. And I want to challenge us this morning to aim to something. Because that is what God is calling you. Amen? Amen. But after having vision, you got to have motivation. Yeah. Amen? Because you can have a great vision. You can see things and you can be like, man, this would be awesome if this and this and this happened. But if you don't have the motivation to do anything about it, do you think that vision is going to get done? No. Not at all. Turn with me to John chapter 17. You see, in order to have vision, you got to have a dynamic, godly ambition. Amen. John chapter 17. Point number two, a dynamic, godly ambition. In John chapter 17, verse one, after Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the time has come. Glorify your son, that your son may, be gl may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all the people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave to me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. You know, Jesus, you can see his humility right here. That Jesus, he comes to him knowing that he is about to embark on the hardest thing in his walk with God, which was to go on the cross. And he comes to God, he says, Father, the time has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. Well, many of us might be like, man, geez, that's a little prideful. You're asking God to glorify you, but then you see Jesus' heart. He says, if you glorify me, God, I will glorify you. You know, and I, the, the word that, that really just caught my attention was glorify. Now, in the Greek, 
Right here, it means to make glorious, to bring admiration. And so Jesus' heart, his whole ambition was to bring admiration to God, was to make God look glorious. And I dare say that some of us this morning may not have this heart to bring glory to God. You see, if you want that vision to come true, you got to have a godly ambition to bring admiration come on, bro. to Jesus. Come on, bro. Come on, Aaron. Because Jesus' greatest desire was to magnify God's works. And when was the last time you sat there and thought, today, how am I going to magnify God's works in my life? How am I going to do this? You need to think in the present. Some of us start thinking too far in the future, and we get too far ahead of ourselves, and we forget that we are still in the present, yeah. and that we got to think about what am I going to do today to bring God glory. Yeah. You know, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11 says, if anyone speaks, they should do it as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves... They should do so with the strength God provides so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Amen. You know, Peter made a great point here. He made a point that our words, our service to God should glorify Jesus. Because in the midst of it, that means that Jesus himself will be praised. When's the last time you did something you served so hard And that people just praise God for it. That they just praise God for your servitude for God. That's how you know you're serving the Lord. When someone just looks at you and says, I thank God for you. I praise God because of how deep your love is for me. When glorifying God isn't on the forefront of your mind, you're at risk of robbing God from his glory. You see, if you're not preaching the word, and you're not preaching God's word, and you're not serving his people and people in the world, and you refuse to do it deliberately, that means that you are robbing God from his glory. Don't rob God from his glory. He's going to get it some way. And you might be going through some trials for him to get it, amen? But let's look at Paul. And see his ambition for the vision that God gave him. Romans chapter 15. In Romans 15, verse 17. It says, therefore, I glory in Christ Jesus in my service to God. I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obey God by what I have said and done. By the power of signs and miracles through the power of spirit, so from Jerusalem all the way around to Icrylium, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ. It has always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known so that I would not be building on someone else's foundation. Paul says, I glory in Christ Jesus in my service to God. Other versions say, I boast in my service to God in Christ Jesus. You know, we got to understand, guys, that Paul's ambition was to spread the gospel. Paul's ambition was like, hey, wherever God is going to send me, someone's going to get saved. Wherever God puts me, wherever the Spirit blows me, Jesus' name will be heard. But in verse 17, we also see Paul's heart. He says, I will, in verse 18, I will not venture to speak of anything wow. except what Christ has accomplished through me. Wow. You see, Paul, he didn't say, hey, guys, look what I did. Look how I preached the gospel. He says, nope, this was only accomplished wow. through him. Yeah. Come on, bro. Yeah. Paul's heart, as it, his ambition was to glorify God. You know, Paul's vision only was his vision because it was God's vision for him. And when God's vision is yours and you make it yours, you have this same 
godly and vision. You know, I think about Metro Heights, and, I, and I, I'm, I'm so proud of the church. I'm so proud of how everyone's been working. And I really believe that Romans 15, and many of you guys here, has been really prevalent in your life. You know, it's been awesome. In the last three weeks, we've had eight people come to God. We've had eight precious souls come into his precious kingdom because of what the godly ambition to glorify yeah. Jesus. Yeah. But I believe that it doesn't stop there. You know, that's awesome. We've, we've had eight souls come to the Lord, but that's not enough. Come on, bro. And you shouldn't be satisfied. If you, are, if you are satisfied, you have the wrong heart. If you are satisfied, you might need to get into the scriptures a little bit more to see that there's still a whole world to save, amen? But let's go a little bit deeper because I, I want you guys to see this holy passion that Paul had. Philippians chapter 3. In Philippians chapter 3, In verse 4, Paul says, Though I myself have reasons for such confidence, if anyone else thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. And the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain the resurrection from the dead. You know, Paul, he, he starts off with telling everybody his worldly ambitions his religious ambitions, that he was a Jew of Jews, a Hebrew of Hebrews. When he followed the law, it was faultless. But, you know, he says all that does not matter. All that ambition of the world means nothing. And all that matters was to know Jesus on a deeper level. You know, Paul's main ambition was just to know him. And it's interesting because when he uses the word to know in the Greek, it doesn't mean intellectually. See, sometimes we think we just got to know Jesus intellectually, and, and yes, he died on the cross for us, and he loves us. But what Paul means here in the Greek is to know him personally. Yeah. And when you, when, you, when, you get, when, you, when you understand this, you begin to see the vision that God gave him and how it was fulfilled. Paul, he planted churches. Paul, he went around strengthening churches. He wrote 13 of the 27 books in the New Testament. He went from city to city preaching the good news. Why? All because he wanted to know Jesus more. Wow. See, when you want to know Jesus more, all you want to do is great things for God. All you want to do is dream and dream big for Jesus. But it's interesting because when he goes and he says, man, I, I want to I I understand the power of Jesus' resurrection. You know, when you think of Christ crucified, it's, it's not a past history event. It's, what, it's a dynamic power that is at work within our lives. Yeah. And if this power of, of the resurrection of Jesus is prevalent in our life, there is nothing that we can't do for God. But when you have great vision like this in your heart, there has to be great godly ambition. Yeah, Turn with me as we close to Hebrews chapter 12. Come on, bro. Come on, Eric. In Hebrews chapter 12, 
verse 2. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, it says, Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endures this opposition from sinful man, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. You know what? It's so easy to lose the vision. Yeah. It's so easy to lose the godly ambition when you're not focused on Jesus, oh. the perfecter of your faith. When your vision gets hard, when, when you know that it's going to be challenging, there's going to be times where you're going to feel weary. Yeah. And there's going to be times where you feel like you're just going to lose heart. But if you're lacking vision, focus on Jesus. If you're lacking godly ambition, focus on Jesus. And I believe, family, that if we focus on Jesus, the perfecter of our faith, Metro Heights is going to grow tremendously. Metro Heights is going to become the model that people are inspired by. If we dream big, we're going to have a dynamic impact, not only in the Los Angeles area, but in the world for Jesus. Amen. And to God be all the glory.